Hello everyone, uh, today I'll be presenting on the application of frontier molecular orbital theory or FMO theory to organic chemistry. So I previously used this set of slides uh, for a presentation in uh, my H3 chemistry course and I did this set of slides together with my group mates uh, Cheryl, Chunran and Nicholas. However, for today's presentation, I will be um, uh, modifying right, uh, the presentation slightly uh, to, um, to talk about certain things that I, have, I feel um, I would want to talk more about. As for the presentation previously, we had a time restriction, so I could only focus on certain essential parts. But today, uh, I will talk um, more in depth on certain parts of the presentation that I feel can be uh, further developed. So let me first go through the uh, introduction to the theory, right? Its development and the principles on which it is based on. So some historical background. Uh, this theory, FMO theory, was developed by Japanese chemist Kenichi Fukui in the 1950s while he was attempting to rationalize the chemical reactivity of aromatic hydrocarbons. Right. So I will bring you through his Nobel lecture uh, paper uh, to see how it actually came, what was the motivation for the theory. So because of this theory and because of some further work that he did together with uh, Ruth Hoffman, right, uh, in explaining the um, uh, the reactions of particular uh, dienes and dienophiles, right, in the Diels elder reaction, etc., uh, he actually won the Nobel Prize in uh, chemistry in 1981. So let me go through the paper in detail. So this is one part which uh, I didn't go through in the previous presentation, which I'll go through now, right? Uh, not this one, sorry. Uh, this one. Yes. So this was the Nobel lecture paper that he um, that he actually delivered a presentation uh, using this paper, right? Uh, in uh, in the when he when he went to um, Sweden to receive the Nobel Prize. Okay. So the motivation for this paper that he spelled out very clearly in the introduction, right, is that in the past, right, actually not, not in the very uh, like long ago past, but in the recent past, right, maybe 19, before, basically before the theory, before he came up with this theory and before this theory was widely accepted, most chemists uh, knew about um, quantum mechanical calculations, knew about these theoretical methods to calculate to compute um, electron densities, right, in molecules. So um, a lot of uh, the electronic theory that came about was based on electron density, right? Was based on using electron density in the molecule to explain its chemical reactivity. So it linked chemical reactivity to the distribution of electron density in the molecule. Okay, so if you read here, so they explain, for example, it makes sense, you know, that um, electrophilic reagents, right, electrophilic reagents would attack the position of a large electron density and similarly, a nucleophilic uh, reaction would occur at the site of a lower electron density. So people use this idea of just, you know, co uh, correlating high electron density to electro, um, uh, high electron density to a nucleophilic region, right, which will react with an electrophilic reagent, while a lower electron density regions will be will, will correspond to regions uh, that are electrophilic uh, sites in the molecule and hence would react uh, if with a nucleophile, right. So that was the general understanding before uh, his idea came about. So. So then there was an obstacle. So usually before some theory is uh, is created or developed in greater depth, there will usually be some motivation, right? So in this case, the motivation for his theory, for the FMO theory, was this a problem. So however, the question, as he, as he writes here, however, the question, why one of the simplest reactions known from long before the electrophilic substitution in naphthalene, for, for instance, such as nitration, use alpha-substituted derivatives predominantly? was not so easy to answer. So people observed, right, chemists at the time observed that in the reactions of naphthalene, right, um, both the electrophiles and nucleophiles would react at the same location, the alpha position. Right? So if you see naphthalene here in this in this uh in this image, you see naphthalene and alpha position is uh, this basically the uh this 
first carbon, right, that basically where the arrow is pointing to. You can see this black arrow with the NO2 plus, the electrophile, attacking this alpha position. So they were not able to explain because, you know, if sites of electron dense if electron density uh, varies from uh, atom to atom in a molecule then there will be a part atom with high electron density a part with low electron density so how is it possible that electrophile and nucleophile can attack at the same position right in uh, the molecule so this was one of the puzzles that uh, confused many people right people with uh, with the general understanding of this this general understanding of correlating electron density to nucleophilic or electrophilic character uh, uh, didn't know how to explain it so this was when he came up with this theory of um, frontier molecular orbitals so he did some calculation right and he and of course there were methods that were available at the time so he was able to calculate you know uh, the distribution of the electrons occupying the highest energy a pi orbital of naphthalene and with this uh, attempt right so he so basically in this case you know if we use fmo terms this highest energy pi orbital of the naphthalene molecule would be its homo its highest occupied molecular orbital right so he calculated it and he calculated the electron not the electron density but the electron distribution the electron distribution of uh, the electrons in this homo right not the electron density this is different from electron density it is the electron distribution only of the homo and not of the whole molecule only of the homo so he did this and he right he found out that actually uh, this approach by just looking at the homo's uh, electron distribution was uh, better uh, in explaining this peculiar observation right with almost perfect agreement between the actual position of electrophilic attack and the site of large density of these specified electrons it's exemplified in figure one so you can see here this figure on the right side you can see how um <coughs> the contour lines uh depict right the electron distribution in the homo right showing how uh at the alpha position right this is where the homo has a uh, the coefficient of the homo lies a uh, greater on and right and hence <laughs> there's a greater um likelihood that electrophilic uh, attack would occur there at the alpha position so this helped to solve the problem that chemists right um, previously were not able to solve and so uh, this was uh, how this uh, this motivated the theory how how this uh, fmo theory came about right and of course uh, there is essentially no reason to to limit uh, uh, these uh, particular orbitals right homos and lumos right consideration of the frontier molecular orbitals the hope the highest occupied molecular orbital and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital to just pi orbitals to not just explaining the reactions of uh, these aromatic hydrocarbons but this method was uh, can also be applied to unsaturated compounds but also to saturated compounds so we can talk about um you know applying this method to um, reactions such as the hydrogen abstraction right by radicals from alkanes so paraffinic uh, hydrocarbons was an old term to refer to alkanes right alkanes as well as the uh, uh, sn2 and se2 reactions in halogenated hydrocarbons basically uh, halogenoalkanes, alkanes right uh, and, and also the nucleophilic abstraction of um, alpha hydrogen from alkenes olefins are alkenes right so there's a great uh, abundance of reactions that he realized you could actually apply the homo lumo concept to but uh, the reason why he actually um, received um, was able to will get the nobel prize together with uh, uh Ruth hoffman was because he used his theory to actually help to explain right uh, particular characteristics of Dew's elder reactions right and other orbital controlled reactions uh, between uh, dienes and dienophiles right so he was able to use it uh, to explain a uh, woodman hoffman rules and etc and with us uh, with a lot of um, accuracy in, ex in his explanation so this also this was basically um they found you know he found that this application of his theory to you know this class of reactions right uh actually was this application was actually quite good right in in in, a, in in applying to this class of reactions uh between dienes and dienophiles so yeah that's why he won it together with uh Rook hoffman 
So that is some uh, background on the theory, right? So the motive I explained the motivation, how the how the theory came about, and uh, why did he win it with uh, Ruth Hoffman in 1981? Yeah. Oh yeah, so actually I should have gone through this slide first before I went through the, I went through the previous one. So as I just mentioned just now, right, I use the terms HOMO and LUMO referring to highest occupied molecular orbital, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So HOMO is typically high energy filled pi sigma non-bonding lone pair orbitals, NLP, non-bonding lone pair of uh, molecular orbitals. So the lone pair orbitals, you know, in this uh, carbonyl compound, right, of oxygen. Um, the high molecular orbital of the aromatic ring right in methoxybenzene of course with significant contribution from the oxygen lone pair because the lone pair is delocalized right into the aromatic ring so we cannot discount the fact that it is there's this delocalization occurring so we must take into account the, the pi molecular orbitals are not just the pi molecular orbitals of a benzene right it is pi molecular orbitals with contribution from the lone pair on the oxygen atom right <coughs> For the LUMOs, they're typically low energy unfilled pi star or sigma star MOs, such as so we typically talk about the pi star MO of carbonyl groups, right? In the nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl group, we talk about the interaction between the pi star MO of the carbonyl group with uh, the uh, nucleophiles uh, HOMO. Similarly, we also talk about SN2 reactions, right, of chloromethane uh, or any other halogenoalkane for that matter. Um, we talk about a sigma star of the CCL bond or the C halogen bond in general, right? For the SN2 reactions. So, yeah, you can see the wide applicability, right, of the FMO theory to the wide class of uh, organic, uh, chem organic chemistry reactions, right? So another feature, you know, that, you know, so I'll just be going through some of the postulates of the theory. So, you know, the theory tells us that by considering the homo-lumo interaction between two molecules, it allows us to determine their mutual chemical reactivity. In other words, do they react well with each other? Reaction occur when the homo of one molecule interacts with the lumo of another molecule. So we can visualize this as the flow of electron density from the homo of the, let's say, nucleophile to the LUMO of the electrophile. So we can also, you know, because, you know, nucleophile can be uh, said to be a Lewis base, uh, electrophile can be said to be Lewis acid in some sense. So we can also, you know, use a uh, homo-lumo description, right, uh, for uh, Lewis acid base reactions. So what does the strength of a homo-lumo um, so the strength of interaction depends on the energy difference between two interacting orbitals, right? So some of you may be wondering, some of you may be wondering, why is it that the only interaction between the frontier MOs need to be considered and that the interactions between the other uh, orbitals, right? Let's say if, uh, if you look at my cursor, there's this, um, then what about the one below, the, red, the one in the red circle, with the one above uh, the one in the red circle here, right? What if... Uh, why don't we consider that? Why not? Why not? Why is it just the homo and the lumo that's considered? Well, the answer lies in the fact that when you consider only only the interactions between the orbitals of their closer energy would be significant to consider. Would be significant to consider, right? So if you look at the one in the red circles, they produce a very strong interaction. And how do we know that? We can see a very a large degree of uh, energy lowering of the bonding orbital when the interaction occurs, right? The Ea, uh, e, uh, denoted, so the interaction in energy denoted by Ea is quite large. Compared to Eb with the interaction energy for uh, the interaction between the, um, the orbital that the, the orbital that's lower in energy than the HOMO and the orbital that's higher energy than the LUMO. So we see that the interaction energy Eb is significantly smaller than Ea and so there, actually there's no need, right? I mean, <coughs> well, in practice, in theory, I mean, sorry, in theory, you could, con, um, calc, uh, you know, add, take into account these interactions, but uh, in practice, uh, you can see that they're negligible, right? So hence, uh, only the homo and lumo are of concern to us. So now I'll be going through some factors that affect the energies of molecular orbitals. So I assume you already know, right? Uh, MO theory, basic MO theory, like um, how to do the, how to draw MO diagrams for diatomic uh, molecules from period two, right? So with that in mind, uh, you should be, um, 
So I will just go through just this section uh, rather briefly, assuming that you already know the ideas, basic ideas of MO theory. So yeah, electronegativity of atoms is an important factor in determining the MO energies, right? So of course, uh, the more electronegative atoms would have their valence orbitals already of lower energy, right? So if we compare of carbon to fluorine, because fluorine is already uh, more elect is or is ele more electronegative than carbon, it will thus have its valence orbitals already lower in energy. So when it forms a bond, right, it is it is obvious, it, it will definitely be be quite true that the sigma star of the CF bond will be lower than uh, the anti-bonding orbital of the corresponding CC bond, right? And the sigma CF will also be lower in energy compared to the corresponding uh, bonding orbital of the CC bond, the sigma CC uh, MO. So, yeah, electronegativity affects uh, <coughs> affects the MO energies. So, the nucleophilicity trend actually parallels, right, uh, electronegativity trends, right? So if you talk about the homo energies of this class of nucleophiles uh, containing um, phosphine, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and water, you see, you see that as the electronegativity decreases from oxygen to phosphorus, the homo energy actually increases from uh, water to phosphine, right? Because uh, it is quite uh, uh, clear here because the physically what, what, why, why this occurs is because the pair of electrons, right, in, the, in this case, for this class of nucleophiles, the HOMO will be the lone pair orbital uh, largely localized on the electronegative atom, right? So this lone pair would experience less of the nuclear charge, essentially, right? But that, I mean, that is how uh, electronegativity is, what, what electronegativity is based on. It's based on the elect effective nuclear charge that is experienced by the valence electrons, right? So in this case, right, as the, the, as the effective nuclear charge experienced by the lone pair decreases, from oxygen to phosphorus, it is more able for is more um, it, the the molecule is more able to donate it away, right? And hence we can say that the homo energy is higher, increases from uh, water to phosphine. Another um, another um, type of another class of um, reagents we can discuss is the organo uh, metallic reagents, right? So organo metallic reagents contain metal carbon bonds. And metal carbon bonds, you know, these are organometallics, are usually nucleophilic reagents, right? Grignards, organolithiums, these are all uh, nucleophilic reagents. And they contain under, and why is that so? Because they have a very high energy HOMO, right? And that is the sigma MO of the metal carbon bond. So firstly, the metal carbon bond is rather weak, right? So the it produces a very weak interaction between the metal uh, a atomic orbital and the carbon atomic orbital. So by that itself, the sigma, the bonding of MO should already be quite high in energy. And not just that, the metal valence, because of the electropositive nature, right, of the metal atoms, they would have high energy of valence atomic orbitals. Recall that previously we discussed that electronegative atoms would have lower valence atomic orbital and um, valence atomic orbitals of lower energy, right? So for example, if I look back at fluorine, at fluorine, it has a lower uh, valence atomic orbital, uh, lower energy valence atomic orbitals compared to carbon. So similarly, if you look at the reverse, right, electropositive atoms, which are not very electron, are not very, are the least electronegative, they will have very high energy uh, valence atomic orbitals, and hence the MOs that they form will also be quite high in energy. So another factor is clearly the type of MO, whether they're sigma pi or non-bonding for the HOMO. So if you read here, the energies increase in the order for the HOMOs, sigma to pi to the non-bonding lone pair, right? So obviously, uh, sigma and pi are lower in energy because they are held in the bonding region. They experience a nuclear charge of both the bonding partners. Whereas, right, the non-bonding non, non lone pair only experiences the nuclear charge of the atom that is holding the lone pair, right? So hence, you will naturally be high in energy, right? What about for the LUMOS? So again, um, sigma star and pi star, they are anti-bonding. So they will be raised in energy relative to a valence atomic orbital. So vacant p orbitals, they are as good as, right, uncombined valence atomic orbitals, right, of, let's say, carbocations, it will be the, um, it will be carbons, uh, 
vacant p of uh, p orbital right so it will make sense that they will thus be of lower energy compared to the anti-bonding uh, sigma star and pi star which are which are produced as a result of an anti-bonding interaction between two atoms so thus there will be raised in energy relative to the valence atomic orbitals yeah so again conjugation will also be a factor that actually affects so in this case we're talking about pi conjugation in the case of uh, you know as we go in the case of a uh, conjugated uh, uh, enes, uh, alkenes right so in this case uh, I'm well we're comparing the homo and lumo energies of but butadiene to ethene right so um, we can actually construct the molecular orbitals of butadiene the pi molecular orbitals of butadiene right from the pi molecular orbitals of ethene right so if you just uh, combine these uh, these four uh, MOs of uh, ethene, pi MOs of ethene, you actually get out for the four pi MOs of butadiene. And what you notice is that the HOMO is raised in energy relative to ethene's HOMO, while the LUMO is uh, lower in energy relative uh, to uh, ethene's uh, LUMO. That, that means to say that butadiene is more reactive towards electrophiles and also more reactive towards nucleophiles right because its LUMO is more accessible energetically accessible its HOMO is also better able to assess the LUMO of electro other electrophiles right so this is uh, what we can observe uh, from this deduce from this uh, anal MO analysis and similarly we can also extend this conjugation even further to let's say hexa triene right and that would also, uh, or even octa tetraene, right? So those will also have longer conjugated pi systems, and they will also experience their HOMO being a raised in energy and the LUMO being a lower in energy relative, right, to the previous, uh, to the, to butadiene and uh, ethene, right? But of course, I think the extent of ra uh, raising of the homo energy and the raising of the lumo energy would decrease as the chain length increases, right? So another type of conjugation is conjugation involving lone pairs, and that would also affect the MO energies. So we can look at the case of the amide. In fact, um, other acid derivatives as well, but I'll not discuss it here, right? So in amide, you can see that the lone pair a orbital on the nucleus on the nitrogen atom it can is able to uh, uh, interact with the CO pi star MO in the molecule right forming a new uh, a new uh, homo in the molecule right which is this uh, which is this uh, orbital with the yellow electrons or orange electrons you can see here right so the so we can see that the lone pair on the nitrogen atom is stabilized right uh, as a result of this interaction while the CO pi star uh, MO, which is the LUMO of the molecule, is raised in energy. So, and this makes sense because the amide is uh, less reactive compared to the other acid derivatives in a set in the in the nucleophilic addition reaction, right? It's, the, it's less able to undergo nucleophilic addition relative to the other acid derivatives. And we can see this, explain this by the fact that uh, the LUMO energy is higher as a result of this interaction with the nitrogen lone pair at the same time we can also say we can also explain why the nitrogen atoms <coughs> nitrogen atoms uh, lone pair is not very uh, it's not it's not really that good at donation to other electrophiles and that's because its lone pair is stabilized right as a result of this um, interaction between the MOs and f um, if you want to look at it from the resonance perspective you can look at this resonance structure so this one this so actually this MO analysis right is actually analogous is actually almost the same right as this uh, resonance electron delocalization picture that is shown on the left is essentially the same right is the this MO di diagram is depicting this interaction right in an MO in an MO sense Yeah, so um, another thing to take note is that the MO character borne by uh, different atoms would depend uh, on the atom's electronegativity, right? So the proportion uh, of the atomic orbitals that contribute to the molecular orbital 
varies depending on the electronegativity of the interacting atoms. So if I bring you to two examples, um, li um, lith uh, this organolithium, LiCH3, right? And this uh, chloroalkane, uh, you can see that for the organolithium, right? The lithium ion, the, the lithium at the HOMO is actually polarized towards the uh, more electronegative carbon atom, right? While the LUMO is polarized towards the less electronegative lithium atom, and that's because the HOMO is a filled, atom, uh, filled uh, molecular orbital, right? And so the carbon atom, with this, which is more electronegative, better able to stabilize the electron density, would actually uh, hold a greater coefficient of the HOMO, while the lithium atom would hence hold the uh, hence the opposite also occur for l the LUMO because the LUMO is uh, not filled, it's empty, right? So you will polarize towards the less electronegative lithium atom. Similarly, for um, uh, ca uh, the carbon and chlorine, right, in the CCl bond, right, the HOMO is polarized towards the more electronegative chlorine, and while the LUMO is polarized towards the less electronegative carbon atom, right. So yes, um, so after Fukui made his theory, uh, de developed his theory, uh, two other chemists, Klopman and Salem, also came in uh, to actually contribute to the theory, right? So they discussed, right, uh, that, you know, interactions between molecules can be broken down into two parts, an orbital interaction between the frontier MOs and an electrostatic component, which is between the positive and negative charges, even partial charges, not necessarily full-blown plus and minus but even delta plus and minus we can also look at that so actually they even gave a more mathematical way of quantifying right these contributions in this equation right so this is the klopman salem equation right so there are three parts to this equation right so the first part is uh this first term right which is the interaction between the field orbitals right uh, which I did not discuss previously, but I think I can neglect that for now, right? Um, and what we're concerned with is the second and the third parts. So the the second and so, but but not but not to uh, don't be too quick to dismiss right, that the first term is actually not significant. It is significant, but for every single molecular interaction, it is significant. So so since this is a common denominator across the different class, different different rea uh, organic reactions, we can not just a uh, uh, not look at it uh, in our analysis. So we usually we look at the second and the third terms. So the second term is um, the electrostatic interaction, right? So you can see here something similar to Coulomb's law, Q, Q times Q over R, right? So that's the electrostatic component. And then there's a frontier component, uh, orbital interaction component that is a uh, looking a bit messy. I'm not able to interpret this with my knowledge of uh, uh, quantum chemistry, but um, you. So, so I'm just showing you this equation to tell you that there is a, a mathematical way of quantifying interaction energies. And that was, and this theory of reactivity was developed by uh, Klopman and Salam. Sorry. Yeah, so they talked about these two components, right? And then they further went on to say that you know there's two types of reactions. One is the frontier control reaction, which is essentially what what the the name uh, implies. Right, it's controlled by the frontier molecular orbitals, the HOMO and the LUMO. The dominant interaction between mo uh, molecules, right, in such frontier control reactions, would be the interaction between the frontier orbitals. And in uh, hard soft acid base theory uh, terminology, these are called soft soft combinations. Right, and there's also another class of reactions called um, charge control reactions, and as the name implies, it is where the dominant interaction between the molecules is the electrostatic interaction, and this and the HSAB terminology are are termed hard hard combinations. So in the next video, right, uh, so I'll break this presentation in two parts because if I do not do so, it'll be quite long, so and possibly boring. So I will now cut this video, uh, this presentation in two parts. So the first part, I went through, you know, uh, the foundations of FMO theory, how it came about, right? And for the second part, I will talk about uh, two reactions, right? One of the enone, 
and one of the inner lead. I will analyze uh, these two, uh, the reactions of these two chemical species in greater detail using FMO theory. So stay tuned to find out more about, uh, about the next part of the presentation. So I hope you found um, this presentation useful in understanding uh, FMO theory, if it's new to you. Uh, and thank you.